Numbers 21 verse 4, when they were engaged in a long, difficult journey way to the south, <coughs> that made them grumble. And then there's even one instance, the very first three verses of Numbers 11, where we're not even told why they grumbled. They just seemed to have grumbled for the sake of it. It wasn't that it was too hot or too cold. It wasn't that they ran out of water or food. It was just they grumbled anyway. And here the problem is no water. Verse 2. And given that there was no water, Israel did exactly what you would expect them to do. They chided, they contended, they grumbled, they complained, and they murmured. They launched into an angry, unbelieving tirade filled with accusatory words. And you have that all the way from verse 2 through verse 5. And so we ask the question, what should they have done? The first thing they should have done was remember. They should have remembered. And the first thing they should have remembered was this. Every other time where we have grumbled and complained, there has been a mass funeral afterwards. God has slain us. And we better not do that again. They should have remembered too, that the last 40 years had been a period of continuous miracles. Nobody's clothes wore out. Manna every day. And any time... They needed something. God miraculously provided it for them. They should have remembered that God had interpreted all their troubles for them. He told them time and time again, these difficulties when you're short of meat or water or the journey's hard, all these difficulties are trials. They are designed to test you and see how you respond. These difficulties are not coming because I've forgotten about you and haven't provided water for you, they're coming in order to test you. That's why you are experiencing them. But Israel forgot the whole thing. In short, what Israel should have done when there was no water, they should have remembered and believed, ah yes, this is a test. We've seen this before. This has been happening now for 40 years. We're learning the lesson here. We know what to do. We're to pray and trust in God. And we're to go to Moses and say, Moses, God hasn't provided water for us here. Will you pray for us? And then we can stand back and see the wonderful works of God. Because we know that's what he always does, isn't it? What do you see? But they didn't do it. They forgot. And they forgot, not because they were intellectually dense, but they forgot because they didn't have faith. And in testing circumstances, we forget the spiritual truths of God's word, not because we're stupid intellectually, but because we're unbelieving. And they didn't believe because they were evil. That was why. They hated God. The apostle, or at least the prophet James, writes, My brethren, count it all joy, when you fall into diverse temptations or trials, knowing, and that's a causal, do this because you know that the trial of your faith worketh patience, and patience, etc., works other graces, other graces. The lesson for us is that we are very prone to forget when we're tried with God, when he sends us testing circumstances, and when we forget... <laughs> What do we do? We grumble. We complain. We murmur because we're discontent in our hearts and because we're ungrateful to God and we think he's holding out on us and testing us above what we're able even though 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 says that God will never do that because of our sins. We foolishly misunderstand. Against whom then did Israel vent their spleen? Verse 2 says, They gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. More specifically, verse 3 says, The people showed with 
Moses. And they asked, verses 4 and 5, Why have you done this? Why have you done that? Why haven't you done the other thing? And this is typical. This is what generally happens. That when something goes wrong in the church, and sometimes actually not in the church, people blame church leaders. And they often blame church leaders even when the problems they face are not their fault. Moses was not to blame for there being no water at Kedah. It wasn't his fault. Now what Israel did here is to be understood by us as a model of what you and I must not do. The first thing they did, or thought, or wished, or said was this. First of all, they wished that they were dead. Don't do that. Verse 3. The people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Which is a really stupid thing to say on many, many accounts. If their problem really was as insurmountable as they thought it was, that there was no water and God would not provide them water, sure they were all going to be dead anyway. Just give it a few days. And I ask you, what is to be gained when a Christian in a difficult situation starts wishing that he was dead? How does that help you? This is not the way to react to our problems. Instead, we're to think, God has given me my life. It's not even mine, it's his. And he has promised to take away my life when he wills, and suicide is self-murder. And just as I shouldn't think I wish my neighbor was dead, I shouldn't go around thinking I wish I was dead. And instead of wishing, even praying you could say, because God hears our wish, instead of wishing would God we had died, why not challenge that energy into praying would God that he would come and help us? Wouldn't that be a whole lot more constructive? But... Israel is blind and hardened in its sin. She wished that she was dead. Worse than that, this death wish of Israel in verse 3 was a wish that they had died under God's wrath. Listen to it. Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord? Now, which occasion? was it that they were thinking of here? It could have been in number 16 when Korah, Dathan and Abiram and some others and then 14,700 other people died. Would God that we had died when fire had come out of the temple, the tabernacle and killed some of my brethren? Would God we had died and if only we had been there when the ground had opened up and swallowed some of them? Wouldn't that have been wonderful? Would God we had died when the plague hit us a few years ago? What a stupid, wicked thing to think. Or maybe they were thinking of the incident at the end of Numbers 14, when contrary to God's word, Israel tried to take the south of the promised land anyway by attacking Canaanites and Amalekites and were slaughtered. Would God we had died when our brethren died before the Lord? We identify with all those rebels. Korah, Dathan, Abiram, and those fools that attack, I wish we died with them. You only have to think about what they're saying here to see the wickedness of these words. And then thirdly, they attributed all sorts of false motives to Moses. Now this has to be seen to be believed, what they say here in verse 4. Why have ye, Moses and Aaron, why have ye brought up the congregation of the Lord into the wilderness that we and our cattle should die there? What a question. They come to Moses and Aaron and said, Now, why did you bring us here to kill us and our cattle? How do you answer a question like that? Well, the simple answer is, We didn't bring you here to kill. I mean, where did you ever get the idea that we brought you here to kill you? <laughs> 